Welcome to the second conference in our lineup today. The world changing applications of AI and blockchain, hosted by ZBX. Blockchain and the future of humanity. This new infrastructure provides an unprecedented level of trust. How will this play out in the years ahead? Vinay Gupta. Materium. Okay, there we are. Okay. Hello, everybody. So uh, I want to start with a simple question, which is this. Is anybody happy with the way the world runs? Anybody? Does anybody feel really comfortable with how all this is? I certainly don't. Um, so I want to set the table stakes here, which is the blockchain is probably one of the most innovative forces in the world. And it would be nice if we could demonstrate directly a method for the blockchain to help transform the world into a place that we're all proud to live in rather than being kind of embarrassed and a bit sad, right? uh, if not extremely angry. So I want to start with the table stakes. right? The world is warming very rapidly. We've got enormous economic problems, which result in an, an awful lot of people being very poor. London has recently been paralyzed by a group called Extinction Rebellion, who are really taking to the streets to make some noise about this, and they've been very successful. Negotiated with the government, got a resolution passed declaring the UK was in climate emergency. You know, they're activists who are doing things, actual world-changing work. But I would say that the blockchain community has lost track of a lot of its political vision because of the intractable problems of libertarianism at scale. Right? Governance has proven to be very difficult. The governments have given us a very hard time as we attempt to figure out how to work with them to make the world into a better place, uh, largely because we went in to that negotiation with some kind of naive beliefs which have been extracted by regulators. We've sort of lost our way. Right? We have an enormous amount of very standard, very exciting commercial work just to solve business problems, but the kind of global vision and global scope that we got started with has gotten substantially diluted. And I think that's because it was the wrong vision. It wasn't the vision that offered a realistic chance of success, and I think we need a different vision for the future of the blockchain. So I'm going to propose a very, very simple narrative about how we should think about the future of the blockchain. Right? What is it that we are all working towards collectively? And this is way bigger than my company. Right? I do a tiny little part of this story. This is a story about literally the future of the blockchain, how algorithms, particularly AI, can work with the blockchain to create global systemic change. But I want to be very clear that this is a political vision. This is a story about how we should approach these problems at the highest systemic and metasystemic level. Right? Um, the first thing is, it's very hard to change the system that you're embedded in, right? The injustice of the world is it's in your bank account, it's in your voting, it's in your government, but it's in the fact that most of your phones were made with labor in countries in which people don't have the right to do things like unionize, right? Most of the minerals that we extract to run industrial civilization, these come from bad places, and the blockchain gives us the theoretical possibility of knowing but the practical experience we have is that we are participating in the evils of the world and we feel powerless to change anything. Um, and I want to suggest that we have the possibility of change, right? And I'm going to tell you how. So the simplest thing is this, right? In the digital age, we went through and we took all of the world's knowledge and a fair part of its wisdom and we put that stuff online and we gave every single piece of information a URL. So all the information in the world had names, right? Um, what I do for a living is I build names for material objects. This is the first thing we've done it for. Uh, it is a uh, figure of Captain Kirk in casual attire owned by William Shatner, the actor that played Kirk in Star Trek, and we're working with Mr. Shatner on an anti-counterfeiting project uh, for Hollywood. That's a very lightweight example of just giving things a name and attaching provenance records to it. And lots of people in the blockchain space are doing this. Right? But what I want to suggest is that we need a much broader vision. Right? Beyond legal rights for physical assets, we need a model in which every asset in the world has a unique identifier, like every human being in the world has a unique identifier. We already have this vision with self-sovereign digital identity. We need something that looks like digital identity for things. And we need this for two reasons. Right? The first is, 
it makes it possible to attach legal responsibility to things like carbon. If you have a car, and every time you fill the car with gasoline, your car picks up a whole bunch of bad carbon tokens, and then at the end of the year, you pay a bunch of money to offset those tokens against green environmental uh, carbon offsets or carbon remediation tokens, you can imagine a global economy in which people were genuinely able to see the consequences of their actions. Right? You look at your wallet or you look at your bank account and you can see the bad tokens pouring in as you perform actions that aren't offset. And this is entirely possible. Right? I mean, if you think of bitcoins, you could calculate the average CO2 consumption of the bitcoin blockchain and that's how much carbon you've created by the amount of bitcoin transactions you've done. These things are all calculable, but not just inside of the crypto ecosystem, in the manufacturing industry. All those folks that are working on blockchains for supply chains, all the people that are digging in hard to all of those kinds of issues, there is a strong possibility right the way across that entire space that the blockchain will become the world's global carbon management system. Not as a single individual enterprise, not as a single point of failure company, but as a global carbon management protocol which many, many different technologies and many, many different companies could connect to. And that's a realistic technical possibility. It's probably no harder, given the tools that we have now, than making email interoperate was in the 1980s and 1990s, or making the web work properly on mobile devices was 10 years ago. We really have the possibility of building a global carbon management protocol right across all of these technologies. The second thing that comes out of this is that once every object in the world has an identity that can be used for the carbon or slavery free trade or implementation of things like detecting allergens, right? Why doesn't your phone warn you every time you accidentally buy something you're allergic to? If you decide that you're not going to eat peanuts because they're bad for you, we ought to have technological support for that. But we also ought to have technological support for things like you don't want to import goods from countries that have human rights records you don't like. You set your morality in the software and the software guides you away from decisions which are bad for you. We call this automated morality. We need support from the software to help us make decisions that are truly in line with our values. Um, and if we do succeed in building a world in which physical objects have proper computer identities, digital identities, the other thing is that we can do large-scale optimization. So uh, the average electric drill is used for something like 11 minutes into its entire life, but there's no city in the world where I can have somebody deliver me an electric drill, use it for a couple of hours, and then send it back again and pay five or ten dollars. Right? We can't rent the things that we need because we don't have the right protocols for handling matter, and the result is an enormous amount of overconsumption. Everybody has clothes in their wardrobe, which if you could efficiently rent them, and they always arrived at, on time, and they were always the right size, and you could see exactly how you would look in an application before you put them on, Everybody would have much more access to clothing, but we'd have less stuff cluttering our lives. All the things that you seldom use, that stuff ought to be rented. <clears throat> and the net environmental impact of doing that, it might save us 10, 20, 30% of global consumption in first world countries. It's an enormous step. So I started out on this trajectory in 19, uh, sorry, 2002, when I went from being a tech guy to being an energy policy guy. It was after 9-11. And I desperately wanted to do something about the state of the world. <clears throat> uh, I spent basically 14 years working, trying to get a refugee shelter that I designed into mass production. Uh, some of the spin-offs from that project have done very well. There's a shelter called the Shift Pod. There's the IKEA shelter. But what took me into the blockchain space was the understanding that the systemic problems of the world aren't going to be solved just by cheap housing. Right? I knew how to do cheap housing. We figured out the cheap housing problem. The designs are online. They build five or 10,000 units a year for Burning Man every year. There are a bunch of companies selling these things. No copyright, no patent, all open source. All of those systems weren't enough to produce the kind of systemic change that I wanted. And that was why I joined the Ethereum team and ran the launch process for, for Ethereum. Although the end product of change has to be reflected in the material world, it's all the levels above the material world in finance, in governance, in accountability, and in transparency that we need to transform to get the change in the material world that we want, which is a low-carbon, green economy, which has adequate resources for all human beings and still has the ability to build spaceships. 
Uh, and we can get there. We've got the material resources. We just need better ways of organizing them. And the blockchain is the next step in that, even if it starts out with stories and visions. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs>